everyone. We're going to start. Welcome everyone to our Wednesday, October 23rd school committee. If you would join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I would just like to introduce our school committee. To my right, I have Mr. Tony Gelfi, Mrs. Rachel King, Mrs. Lillian Holbrook, Mr. Michael Dolan, our superintendent, Mr. Swenson. And to my left, I have Leanne Terlecki, the student advisory chair. I have Mr. Hammond and Mr. Florence, and my name is Susan Prewindowski. And we will start with the approval of minutes, motion to approve the minutes of September 25th. Motion by Mrs. Holbrook, second by Mrs. King. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. All right, and next we'll move on to correspondence recognition. Mr. Swenson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we have one <coughs> item under uh, recognition and correspondence. It comes from Mrs. Angela Watson, who's the principal at Bridgewater uh, Rainham Regional High School. And it reads, I am pleased to share with you that Kieran Newberry, a junior at Bridgewater Random Regional High School, has been selected to represent our high school in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at the Congress of Future Medical Leaders in Boston, Massachusetts this past June. The purpose of the Congress is to honor, motivate, and direct our top students in our country who aspire to be physicians or medical scientists and encourage them to stay true to their dream. <coughs> During the Congress, students about the state, of, learned about the state of our diagnostic tools and are inspired by world changing researchers, which included Nobel Peace Prize winners, top medical dean students, leaders in medical research, and cutting edge technology as leaders from the private industry. This is a high honor. It is an indication of one that is achievement through significant success in the field of science, technology, engineering, and math, as well as someone who personifies the high standards of leadership and character. Karen Newberry is, uh, every respect, is a very respected model student and one whom we are, have great pride to uh, represent Bridgewater Rennan Regional High School. So we'd just like to congratulate uh, Kira Newberry on that incredible yeah. honor. That's all we have in the correspondence. All right, next we'll move on to our educational reports. And first up, we have the Student Advisory Council report, Mrs. Holbrook. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to the Student Advisory Board members. These students document and report out on events, club activities, and achievements at the high school, or things going on in their community each month. First, before I introduce you to the students, I would like to introduce you to Ms. McCord. And if you could just stand up, Ms. McCord. <laughs> All of this could not be possible without her wonderful leadership. Ms. McCord will once again be serving as the student advisor this year for the school committee student advisory board. This is Ms. McCord's fifth year advising this group and her ninth year teaching at Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School, where she teaches United States history two and advanced placement United States history. She's looking forward to another year of working with these great students. Thank you. Okay, so prior to um, the students giving their report this evening, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about each member, what activities they are involved in, and what motivated them to join the Student Advisory Board. Um, the first one is Chloe Godfrey. Um, Chloe will serve as the co-chair woman for this year. Unfortunately, Chloe could not be here with us tonight as she had another commitment. So I will wait until the November meeting to introduce um, her. Next, we have Le Leanne Terlecki, and Leanne's also um, serving on the board, and she's returning this year for her second year as on the board as a student advisor. She is a senior and she will serve as co-chairperson of the advisory board. In addition to this, Leanne has served as the vice president of student council. She also is a member of the Yes Club and the Peer Leaders Bridging Lives Collation. 
She is a member of both the girls' varsity soccer team and tennis team and is excited to continue with the advisory board again this year. So Leanne, we'll hear from you first. Um, Ashley, said, my name is Leanne Chalecki, and I'll be speaking about Halloween for the Hungry Drop Club and the Rainwater Fall production. Um, so this year for Halloween for the Hungry, um, Bridgewater Rainham Student Council will once again be holding its annual Halloween for the Hungry fundraiser. This twist on trick-or-treating will take place on Halloween night, with students essentially trick-or-treating for canned goods and non-perishable items instead of candy. Student Council asks that those who are donating leave a bag or as much as anyone is able to give of food outside of their doorstep to be collected. The food will then be donated to the food pantry where those in need will be able to gain access to it. This is one of Student Council's major events, major events throughout the school year and all of those involved are excited to be part of this great fundraiser. Um, for Drama Club, the BRRHS Drama Club held auditions in October for their upcoming Reader's Theater production of Letters by Edwin Mary. For many wars, Letters Home was the only way for a form of communication between soldiers and their loved ones. This play brings those letters to life. The production will be presented Thursday, December 5th at 7 p.m. in the BR Auditorium. A cookies and cocoa reception will follow the performance. Tickets will be $5 in advance, $7 at the door, and will be available soon. Veterans will be free with ID. Um, for the Rainwater Fall production, the Rainwater players will present Disney's Frozen Junior on Saturday, November 23rd at 2 and 7, and again on Sunday, November 24th at 2, in the BRRHS Auditorium. There will be a meet and greet with the characters after each performance, and tickets will be $10. More information will be available soon. To help defray the cost of these shows, the Rainwater Players hosted an evening on Vendor Bingo on Saturday, October 19th. Many vendors rented space for a fun evening of shopping and bingo. The vendors also did, donated the prizes for bingo. It was a great evening for friends and family of all ages. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. This year we also have Libby Sorrow. And she is returning to the school committee student advisory board for her second year. Libby is a junior at BR. In addition to serving on this board, she is also a member of the student council, school climate group, and sign language club. She is also a member of the field hockey team. Libby is excited to continue her participation in the school committee advisory board this year. We'll hear from Libby next. Hi, I'm Libby Saro, and today I'll be talking about the college fair and the new teacher reception. On September 23rd, the college fair was held at school for everyone. Many local colleges from the New England area sent representatives to the school. Students walked around the tables and spoke to the representatives of each school. The represent representatives helped inform the students of all the good opportunities their school has to offer. Pamphlets for the school were handed out to the students. The college fair was a great opportunity to get my questions about colleges answered by the representatives of each college. The new teacher reception was held on October 21st to welcome the new teachers at BR. The reception was held by the school climate group led by Mrs. White and Mrs. Murdoch. The school climate group gathered at the reception to greet all the new teachers, who this year are Mrs. Neckrich, Mrs. Bennett, Mr. Perez, Mrs. Suarez, Mrs. Weber, and Mrs. Short. They also celebrated Mr. Ringette's move from math teacher to assistant principal at the high school. The reception was an enjoyable way to meet all of the new teachers and welcome them into our VR family. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. Next, we have Sarah Pettit. And this school year, Sarah uh, Pettit, it will be her first year serving on the school committee's student advisory board. Including the student advisory board, Sarah also <coughs> participates in student council and is a member of the newspaper club and debate team. Sarah is eager to represent the school environment within the school committee and is delighted to highlight all of the enriching activities or, and events that involve the students in Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School. Sarah. Good evening. 
evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Pettit, and tonight I'll be talking about open house and the French field trip. Bridgewater Greenham hosted their annual open house on September 19th, 2019. Students and their parents were invited to come and tour the high school, as well as meet with their child's teachers. Starting at 5 p.m., seniors and their parents also attended a senior night held in the auditorium before the open house. Parents were able to see their child's schedule in chronological order, as well as meet and discuss their courses with their respective teachers. This year, Bridgewater Rainham also invited the eighth graders from both Bridgewater and Rainham to come to the school in order to see what a typical high school courses and schedules were like. Eighth graders were able to give were given supplementary schedules to follow. During a study block in, in the schedule, or before or after the open house, the club fair was set up in the cafeteria, showcasing the numerous clubs and sports available at BR. This year's open house was very successful and gave parents an insight into their own child's schedule at the high school. On October 16, 2019, French and art classes from Bridgewater Rainier Regional High School visited the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston during the school day. Students from the French classes, and specifically, specifically from French 3, are studying French art and the impact it has on the culture and language of France and other French territories. At the museum, French students viewed paintings from several different artists, such as Picasso and Pollock, showcasing different styles of art, ranging from Impressionism to abstract. Students from the French classes had to write an analysis and an explanation of the paintings in French, commenting on the style and techniques used to create the masterpiece. Concerning art students, they explored artwork for the Museum of Fine Arts for a scavenger hunt. <coughs> Although shorter than expected, students from both the French and art classes were able to see excellent examples of art from around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Also serving on the board is sophomore Ian Farrell. Ian is new to the school committee's student advisory board this year. Ian is a sophomore and outside of this board, he participates as a secretary of the school DECA club. As well as DECA, Ian is also part of the boys cross country, swim, and spring track teams. Ian is very excited to begin his first year as part of the board. Good evening. My name is Ian Farrell, and tonight I'll be talking about the new Earth Science Geography Club and our School Deca Club. So, for the first time ever, the Earth Science Geography Club has officially started. Headed by Miss Kelly, this club gives members a further inside look to the world around them. This club will be having many field trips to numerous sites based around nature. Some of these field trips may also count as community service, as certain activities on the field trip include taking steps to help make this earth that we live on a much healthier, cleaner place. For DECA, uh, within the past few weeks, the BR DECA Club has commenced. DECA is a club based around the ideas and actions needed to succeed and around the, birth, around the world of business. Students have the ability to choose from a wide variety of business categories to compete against school, students from other schools. This competition simulates what it would be like to solve real world problems in certain branches of business, such as entrepreneurship, finance, hospitality services, human resources, and much more. This year has brought many new incoming students as well as a new teacher, Ms. Bennett. The DECA Club is currently in the process of coming up with new fundraising ideas to help raise money for this year's DECA competition. And this concludes our student advisory report. Thank you, Ian. And as you can see, we are very fortunate to have these remarkable young men and women who will be presenting to us monthly. Thank you, and we look forward to your report at our next meeting in November. Thank you. All right, next up we have our MCAS data update, Mr. Powers. And I believe this is a presentation that we
you, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Swenson. I am here tonight to give you an overview of our 2019 spring MCAS results. Uh, I will talk to you a little bit about the district, uh, the, the district results, and then go school by school. And certainly, at any time, if you have any questions, please let me know um, as we go through this. Uh, just to give you kind of an overview of, uh, in terms of uh, which students participated in the MCAS this past spring, uh, as you know, it is uh, administered during the spring to all of our students in grades three through eight, and then our ninth and tenth graders as well at the high school. Uh, so all of our students, grades three through eight, participate in English language arts and mathematics. All students in grades five and eight participate in science, technology, and engineering. And all students in grades 10 participated in the ELA and mathematics. Our uh, students at the high school participate in the grade nine biology MCAS. You'll notice when uh, I'm presenting the data for the high school, the results actually get reported as grade 10 students. So what happens is when they report their grade 10 scores, they uh, include their grade nine results. So even though it's, it looks as though they took the 10th grade science, technology, engineering assessment, it's actually reflective of the ninth grade biology results. We do have some students, depending if they you know, do move in sophomore year, they weren't here freshman year, they may take a different assessment to biology, but the majority of our students take the ninth grade biology. And for the most part, uh, we did administer the assessment online this past spring. Uh, we obviously had a few areas, a few students that still took the paper and pencil, as well as the high school science, uh, the high school biology test was. But that will all be transitioning this year, and we'll be going over to online uh, for the majority of our students. Uh, a couple notable changes, and, and these aren't necessarily new, uh, they're uh, recent, but uh, just to refresh your memory, uh, in around 2017, the department went to a new scoring system in ELA and math, and most recently in science, technology, and engineering for grades three through eight. There are still four reporting categories. Um, however, the new uh, reporting category is referred to as the next generation scoring system compared to the old one, which is referred to as the legacy scoring system, you can't actually compare the two. So for example, uh, an advanced uh, score in the old legacy scoring system, the numbers do not equate uh, to the exceeding expectations. They're different numbers, they're actually different calculations, uh, so therefore they, they really can't be compared. Uh, and our students in grade 10, um, this past year they did use, you'll see up there we go with results, the legacy scoring system, but again that's transitioning for and this just gives you a snapshot, and again, I tried to correspond the colors to what DESI uses in the parent report, uh, but you can see up there our four reporting categories, not meeting expectations, partially meeting expectations, meeting expectations, and exceeding. So you can see the numbers are really different. Uh, for example, the old scoring system, the legacy scoring system, used a 200 uh, number range, so the, the numbers are completely different. Uh, but just to talk to you a little uh, a bit about our district results, you can see up here our uh, English language arts for all of our students grade three through eight, uh, how we did as a district, and then obviously how we did compared to the state. You can see the, as you can see, the results there for the state are on the right and our district is on the left. Um, just uh, comparatively speaking, when you look at our, the, the top two categories, exceeding and meeting, um, in ELA, our students in grades three through eight, we had about 58 percent of our students meeting or exceeding expectations compared to 52 percent of the students. Please with those results. Uh, mathematics, same type of setup. Uh, and again, when we look at our results compared to the state, especially in our top two categories, uh, we're looking at roughly 59 percent of our students meeting or exceeding expectations and only 49 at the state level. And anytime we're above the state, uh, that's it. And then obviously science, technology, and engineering. Um, and again, you look at our results there compared to uh, state as well. Uh, we're roughly at 53% uh, exceeding and meeting expectations uh, compared to 47% for the state. And again, that's just for our grades five and eight students. Uh, the next part of this is to talk about the accountability results. So really we get, re we get scored and reported out in two different areas. One is the assessment, how did our students actually do in the assessment, and how, are, is, or how is the district and how are our individual schools going to be held accountable. Um, there's obviously a formula that goes into this. They really look at our progress uh, in terms of meeting our targets. They factor in last year's progress uh, against this year's progress. Uh, they uh, add them together, they multiply and then add them together. 
and then they uh, get a result. You can see this year's uh, target is 60%. Our performance is 60%. And the, year, the yearly annual target is around 75. So if you were hitting 75%, you're meet, that means you're meeting all your targets. Um, we're at 60%, so you can see that our rating is substantial progress towards our targets. So we haven't quite met our targets, uh, but we are well on our way. Uh, the next slide. Just to give you a little bit more information, I apologize, there's a lot of data up there, so it's probably hard to read. You'll see numbers uh, zero through four, and again, uh, schools in the district are, are rated against uh, certain criteria. The first one being achievement, so how did we do in ELA, how did we do in math, how did we do in science. Next is growth in ELA and math, high school completion, progress towards uh, English language proficiency, so how did our ELL students do, and then there's some additional indicators. Uh, did we reduce our chronic absenteeism? Uh, did we have many students taking advanced coursework? And you're rated, again, zero to four. Four meaning that you uh, exceeded you ex exceeded the target. Three meaning you met the target. Two means you made progress, but you didn't quite meet the target. One, uh, there was no change in zero. If you, if you didn't receive any points, if you have a zero up there, meaning that you actually uh, declined. You'll see that some of those actually have dashes. That's just because there's, there's not a reported uh, category there. So those are not uh, factored into the results overall. But you can see uh, each category, uh, again, has points earned, total possible points. So for example, if you look at achievement, you can see for ELA, total possible points were four. We earned two points as a district, meaning that we made progress, but we didn't quite meet our target. Same for math, science, there was no change um, in our results. So again, we get five out of 12 points there. You can see growth. Uh, again, we made progress in ELA. Math, we met our targets. For high school completion, um, obviously because we're looking at all students, they're not factored in there. When you look over at the high school grades, you can see that four-year cohort graduation rate. We actually exceeded our target. Uh, we actually declined in our extended engagement rate. So looking at those students within a five-year cohort versus a four-year cohort, um, and then obviously annual dropout rate we obviously exceeded our targets there. And by that, I mean um, we just the opposite. We actually reduced the number of dropouts um, even though we exceeded our target. And then obviously our English language um, students, English language learner students, there was a decline in the, their performance as well. And then you can see for chronic absenteeism, we met our target there. So overall, we got three out of four points. And then you can obviously see the high school grades on the right -hand side as well. All those are factored in um, to give uh, our annual target of 62. Compare that to last year's, that's how they come up with the. Again, just to look at the high school results, you can see up there, and, and if you'd like me to go through each one, I certainly can, but you can obviously see via the bar graph. And the reason why the way uh, the state reports it out is the individual school compared to the district compared to the state. And obviously, as you know, you know we do have other in-district programs um, in, for our students. So just because they're not uh, at the high school doesn't mean they're not taking the MCAS. So it would be the numbers really are, are very similar, but that's why they show three different. You can see, for the most part, um, in all categories, we are again outscoring the state, which is really what our target is always been. And you can see the accountability results there. Uh, one notable. Um, Result I will point out to you is up the top there, and it may be hard for you to see. Um, last year's uh, target percentage uh, in terms of how they uh, scored overall was at 33%. And again, if you remember, I said the target really is 60, I'm sorry, 75. You want to be at 75%. This year was at 60. So they went up from 33 up to 60 this year. So that's quite a jump. Uh, so hats off to Ms. Watson and her team at the high school. We're very pleased with, with their results overall. Uh, BMS, again, you can see up there in terms of the graphs, and like I said, happy to go through them all if you'd like, uh, but you can see overall, again, our target is always to, to be above the state average, and you can see. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I, yes, I do think the idea is that, you know, 100% of your students would either be proficient or advanced. I, I don't know if it would ever be realistic to have 100% of your students in the exceeding category. Um, it certainly is a target and something we strive for, uh, but in terms of 
being realistic, I, I don't think so. But uh, ideally, you know, it, it is possible that we would have a certain grade level that would have 100% of their students meeting or exceeding. Uh, right. Here, I'll cut the graph off at 60 so it looks like we're, we're there. No, I, I know what you're saying. I'm, I'm just, yeah. Right. Follow. Absolutely. It's true. We are, absolutely. And, and that's something that we definitely pay close attention to. Um, one, we obviously look at our DART districts to see how we're doing there. Uh, but really, the benchmark is the state. That's, you know, when the state releases that data, they, you know, they do tell you to use it as a benchmark. How are you doing compared to the state? And certainly, we want to be well above the state. And you can see, depending on the school and depending on the grade and the, the content area, we're either right with the state or slightly above, or in some areas we exceed. Uh, but that is definitely our goal. Not just to be above the state, but obviously to continue to improve. And then again, BMS accountability results. And um, again, just to point out for BMS, one area to note, you can see last year's results compared to this year. Last year they were at 37%, this year they're at 60 So again, a nice jump for Mr. Caleb, Mr. Hines, and the staff at BMS. Next is RMS. You can see now, um, again, you know, you start to look, you know, depending on the grade level, uh, ELA, uh, the results are, are fairly similar between the state. So that's something that we would definitely take a look at and say, okay, what is, uh, you know, what's going on there? How come we're not, you know, uh, well above the state in those particular areas? Uh, same thing, we would do the same thing for math. Math's a little bit better. We're at 56% compared to 49% for the, for the state. And then same thing with science, but in terms of Overall, we're, we're fairly close. We're 55% for ELA versus 52% of the state. So we, we know we're, we have a little bit of work to do there in ELA. And then obviously science, as you can see there, we're at 52% uh, uh, compared to 47%. So we are above the state. Now I see the RMS accountability data. And again, one you know thing to note too for all of our schools, None of our schools or the district itself is uh, in the requiring assistance category in terms of accountability, uh, which is obviously a, a key thing to note. Um, as you know, in the, under the old system, they used to level the schools. So if you were level one, that would be a, a top performing school all the way down to level five being taken over by the state. Uh, they've since changed that and they do it now based on uh, what type of assistance do you actually need from the state and all of our schools in the district uh, falls into that not requiring assistance. Uh, again, you see the Williams results. I'll go through those if you have questions. Results. Uh, Law Liberty. As you remember last year, Law Liberty was a school of recognition, and although they did have um, a slight decrease in their scores, they still did very, very well. Uh, we're very proud of how they did. Uh, they're at uh, about 70% um, meeting or exceeding expectations in English language arts, and they are at 67% uh, uh, compared to, uh, I'm sorry, 67% for, for math, and then compared to the state, I should go back to that. Um, so they're at 70% uh, for ELA, the state is at 62 For math, they are at 67, and the state's at 49. So you can see the Law of Liberty is still doing quite well compared to the state. And, and, you know, we did say last year it certainly is a challenge once you get to the top to stay at the top. Uh, that's even sometimes more of a challenge to get there. Uh, but obviously, as, as we've said, uh, you know, they are still doing very, very well. Um, you can see that they are still meeting or exceeding their targets. Again, that number was right there, that magic number is 75. So they're coming in 87. So they're still uh, exceeding their targets in most areas. We're still very proud of Law Liberty in there. Uh, the Mitchell assessments, you obviously have uh, that information there in front of you. ELA, uh, again, compared to the state, the state's at uh, 52, we are at 63, so again, above the state in uh, ELA. And then for math, we are at 51 compared to 49 for the state. So again, we, we'd like that gap to be a little bit bigger compared to how we did. Uh, 
Uh, but one thing to note again, uh, look at you know last year's numbers versus this year's numbers, uh, 39 up to 53. Uh, so again, we would you know we certainly feel as though the Mitchell School is doing well under Mr. Bray's leadership, uh, along with Mr. Bratt, and they're moving that school in the right direction. Uh, so Mr. Bray continues to to uh, do a great job in terms of instructional leadership and moving his school wherever he's at. So a uh, you know, big shout out to Mr. Bray. Uh, I did want to just kind of touch for the, touch upon this for the parents in the audience, or certainly for uh, the many watching at home, and, and certainly for the school committee, just to kind of go over uh, what the results will look like. Uh, parents will be getting, uh, obviously they already have their parent guardian report, and it'll you know highlight some key information. Uh, obviously what they're going to show you is, is uh, the results. They'll break it down into category. If your student only took ELA and math, and that's all that will be re be reported. Uh, they're using here an example of eighth grade, so it's actually ELA math and science, technology, and engineering. They give you the achievement level. So this particular student met the expectations in ELA, partially met them in math, and then met them in science, technology, and engineering. Uh, they did give some, inf they, obviously they give the overall score, what the score was for a number, and they give you the score ranges there so you can see where exactly you fell within that range. And then they give you a growth percentile um, again, compared to the cohort of students score that having uh, similar results to you in the past. So that's the first part of information that is given. I did include what it looks like at the 10th grade level only for those parents uh, because it will indicate whether or not they have met their high school uh, competency determination, which is obviously what's needed to be a high school graduate. Uh, so again, it looks a little bit different. It, it, it doesn't necessarily give a uh, you know, met, exceeded, it really says passed or has not yet met. So again, it just gives a little bit different information. And you can see there for biology, it obviously has the old. Yes? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Holbrook, that's a great question. Uh, so there's actually several opportunities to retake the test. Um, so to, again, depending on the subject, kind of depends on the time of year when that retest is given. Uh, but the, the students do have an opportunity to retest uh, each year. So again, if the student doesn't pass it in 10th grade, they can take a retest in 11th grade and then obviously continue to do so from there uh, all the way up until uh, throughout their 12th grade year. And so again, just to kind of show the uh, color correspondence there, this would be the you know, second to fourth page of the report, what it would look like. It kind of gives you a, a better description of what each category means, what the uh, reporting categories are in terms of uh, number-wise, where you would fall. That information there, you can see the, the gray bar right there. That's just an indication of if your child took this test multiple times, uh, what range is expected that they would fall in. Uh, so you can see, obviously, this particular student's at 522. You know, there is the expectation that that student would perform a little bit better, but also a little bit worse, depending on the time that they, that he or she took the exam. And then again, just some additional information um, on this particular slide about growth. Um, you can see there, it shows where your child is, where the school is, where the district is. Uh, really what we're, we're always shooting for is between 40 and 60, that's ideal growth. Obviously the 50th percentile is you know, smack dab in the middle, but we're looking for our students to fall between that 40 and 60th percentile. You can see that you know, this particular student had very, very high growth. Uh, so from one year to the next, uh, they obviously performed very, very well. And you can see for the most part the district, and, and these are just sample examples, they're not our district, but you can see. Uh, the other thing that obviously this shows you uh, on the left-hand side, it gives you some historical information about the student's performance, and then it gives you the average score. So you can see how your child did compared to the district and, again, compared to the state. And then lastly, it just gives you some more detailed information in terms of um, item analysis, uh, what the results were, how they scored, uh, what were the reporting categories, uh, or the, the assessed categories, and just gives the parents a little bit. Happy to take any questions. That's a great question, Mr. Florence. Thank you very much. Um, so a couple of things that we've done uh, as this data has become available and rolled out, 
We've met with all of our building administrators, reviewed the data with them, offered additional sessions uh, with Ms. Richards, our coordinator of teaching and learning, to sit down, pour through the data. What exactly does it mean? Uh, what do we see from the district level compared to maybe what they see at the site level? And then Ms. Richards has made herself available to the principals to actually go out and work with the faculty and staff. So I know she was actually at RMS today uh, going over um, the MCAS ELA data, looking specifically at writing, uh, talking about instructional what talking one first about the data, talking two about instructional strategies, how maybe they need to shift their, their instruction. Um, she's offered that at the other sites as well. So I know she has a plan to go out, spend time with the principals, spend time with the staff. Uh, and really looking at the data and if there are areas that we need to improve, spending some time uh, again with staff putting practices in place. Uh, that's not in this information, Dr. Premandowski, and I don't know off the top of my head, but I can certainly get it to you um, before the end of the meeting, or I can even... Yes, yes, we have very few students that uh, end up needing to take the retest. All right, thank you very much. Why don't we take it out of order? Yeah, motion, motion to, to take, take Meg out of order. <laughs> Meg out of order. I don't know what number she is. Sorry, Meg. She's E. Uh, item E out of order. E and F. I'm guessing. Ooh. I'm guessing we're going to do F so that she can do the presentation. And leave the screen down. Motion by okay. Mr. Dolan. Second by Mr. Gelfi. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Miss Meg, you're up. Okay. Aye, aye. <laughs> Uh, I don't, but I can pull that up too. No, actually, you can do that. Okay, sounds good. Yep, that's perfect. Well, um, good evening, Chairman, Chairwoman, Dr. Priyandowski, and Superintendent Swenson, and members of the school committee. It's my pleasure to be here with you tonight um, to present to you the Unified Classroom, an enhanced version of our Power School Parent Student Portal, which we have previously been using. So as you can see here, this will look familiar to you. This is a view of our dashboard that we were familiar with, um, which we have been, was in operation until October 1st. As you can see, something familiar here, the menu on the side, there was a list of the students' um, courses and their grades current grades, you could flip between your students here, okay? Well, and then if I clicked on a number grade here, anything in blue, you'd see I would up would pop um, a list of how, what made that grade, what was the numbers behind that grade, 
And um, we, were, we liked it. We were happy with it. But people wanted more. They wanted more of a connection to the classroom. So, um, in we introduced the unified classroom that creates a um, more of that connection for both students, parents, and teachers um, to the classroom. And if we hop on, I'd just like to um, jump right into this the stuff we all want to see. So once parents um, make their unified classroom account and expand their existing account, they'd did enter their username and password and click sign in. And off they had come to view the dashboard. Maybe if we wanted to turn down the lights, we might see that a little better. But um, right here, you'll see is a list, uh, a calendar view. Um, here are the current grades. This shows um, the upcoming assignments and recent assignments that have been graded. This area right here um, would show uh, posting of um, news from the classroom, like the teachers might post, hey, remember your algebra test? It's kind of like a little test. Um, let me start using that. Um, now, I can also, up here, um, click between students. I have multiple. My child here is Matthew Cohen. He's top notch. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, so it, it's um, it, by just logging in and looking at this screen, I can get a nice glimpse of what's happening um, in um, uh, for my student for that day, or get a just get a little temperature test of how things are going. Um, if I were to click on Quick Links, which is right over here, um, that would bring me to this menu, which you'll see pops out, and it has a lot of links that are, we're familiar with. It has ones um, like um, one big one that was very helpful to everyone that everybody liked. Um, it has the school bulletin, current grades and attendance, another shortcut to that. It also includes, remember, the annual re-registration. And AKA, that was the link to our electronic student emergency contact form, which was, um, we were excited to say, was quite a success this year. Instead of that paper form that we would send home each uh, September, we did it electronically. And we got about 81% response back from that form. Um, and then we follow it up. We hope that next year it will only get better. Um, we plan on releasing that a little earlier in the year, in the, before school starts, giving parents a little time before that rush of the start of school to fill out that form. But we were excited about it, how well it went. Um, and the feedback, we got a lot of nice feedback, which is always a bonus. Um, none if you click on the calendar, the calendar, this might look a little overpowering, but it does show um, at a week's view all of the assignments. Now these might not be all assignments that student had to do, but it shows what the teacher might have graded, um, and, um, but also what's upcoming. And it is color coded. And um, that would show like a color coding, depending on how the teacher determines it, but a color coding for what's a test, what's classwork, what's homework, things like that. All right, so now um, right above that, you'll see the next one is the progress button. And that is uh, a glance at all the assignments. And this is where, oops, see this. Um, this is where, if you go here, you have little column headings. It shows the date the assignment was due. Um, and then it has what's called flags. And those are notations that the teacher can make to point out if the assignment is missing 
or your child was absent or let the child know they were absent, which they probably know, but it kind of stands out there for them, um, or the, if they were exempt from that assignment. Okay. And then the next thing you'd want to do is then there's class pages. And this is the, the bit of that gives you um, a little more of a sense of what's happening. Um, so if it shows all Matthew's classes here in this list. If I clicked on that Algebra 1, I would go into um, this Algebra 1 class with Mrs. Smith. And I'd have a little, here's Mrs. Smith, she's working hard right here. Um, I would have a little description, telling the student a little about uh, the teacher, and then underneath here is a little uh, class description with a link to the syllabus. And then the teacher can also put out some um, important stuff she wants to highlight, and that would be her grading policy, which is always helpful. Um, to know. And then you see she has a calendar here, and this is a link to the textbook resources that are online and gives the student the code and how to get in. So that's okay. it. Helped. Yes, sir. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, do we know how many um, or what percentage of uh, class uh, pages look like this? Um, well, we had a we had a um, half day um, where teachers took some time, and then they, we had the month of September for them to get their pages going. Um, and their pages are evolving. Um, I can see as as they get using it as the year unfolds. What you don't see right here, and I'll show you in another one of the samples of a lower grade is. Over here, you can have sub pages to this page, okay. like so this. We have provided professional development for teachers. We have, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And then we do have in the buildings, um, uh, but we offer continuous support. So we do have uh, Power Teacher Pro um, in-house trainers, the train the trainer kind of a model that work with the teachers. And then there's also visiting them during faculty meetings and. PLCs and those kind of things. And then uh, they always reach out to, but it's always a model we're trying to improve. Um, but so I'll, I'll skip on here. Here's a sample of a middle school page. Um, um, and also you'll see the middle school teacher, she used a few different blocks. She has here some important links um, to resources that are helpful for the uh, student and the parent supporting their child. Also, she has a connection to the uh, dojo page, but this could usually be a doorway into her uh, Google Classroom. Um, also down here is some important documents. This might be a study guide they, that's needed for the upcoming test or a worksheet. Um, that they need to fill out, kind of like um, the thing diagram. This, um, and over here, she has her calendar, which is another way a student can click on a date to see what's going on on that date. Okay, and then so this is a middle school, and then here is a, a sample elementary. Now you might say, well, what's going on here with Mrs. Parker? Well. Mrs. Parker just oopsie daisy. Mrs. Parker just set up her page a little differently. She has those sub pages over here. So she has one for wonders and a one for everyday math. Um, and so that's why it just looks a little different. Okay. Excuse me. Is there a link that goes to the ST Math also or Right. So on uh, the everyday math is she might have her link, but in this case with this teacher she had an ST math. Give away some acceptance there. So on this here, she has the ST math link right there. So this is a link block where she has those important links. Okay? And so we'll hop through. So that's a sample elementary. And so what's up with the app? 
because um, we all love the app. And that was one thing why, because um, Unified Classroom is Power School portal. And one thing why we didn't step to the enhanced part is we enjoyed the app so much and what it offered. And we didn't want that app to go away. Well, it doesn't. Parents and students can continue to use the app as they always have. So if you use the iPhone or an Android, you use your existing user, user ID and password you've always used for uh, your parent power school portal. And so does this student. Um, I did, I was going to show you side by side what the parent, what, when a parent logs in, what they see, and what a student logs in, and they see, excuse me, but it's very, it's, it's identical. The only thing a student can do more is pass in, pass in assignments, which you know, pass in. <laughs> um, so, um, so that's an exciting thing, and people are very happy about that. So I wanted to pull up, point out for anyone watching, anyone here tonight, that we do have a growing library of resources on our website. So if you go to our website, you'll notice a very fashionable link here, Unified Classroom. You click on that, it leads you to these resources. In production right now, uh, instructional videos that will all, also be posted that will provide you with um, you know, video instructions on how to create the account. Um, but um, I think that's all. Um, if you have any questions, or stay tuned. Okay. Who does the production of the videos? Oh, is the... it actual teachers that have already done it? Or... Uh, no, that was just that's me. Uh, it, myself and the team of power school trainers. Um, in-house that are going to are uh, working on those to put those up. Um, but we find it, it will be whatever, whatever mode that people will be most helpful to people to um, assist them in creating those accounts um, is what we are going to place up there. So those should be posted um, in the middle of next week. And then what has the response been from parents, from teachers, with regards to this? Uh, well, I think the teachers have been anxious for you waiting for it, because we've talked about it a lot. They've done um, some page preparation. Um, but with anything new, I think it, it, it's a time to you know uh, build up confidence with it. Uh, with parents, and guardians, I believe, as we move closer to report card time and that sort of thing, um, they'll be more um, accessing um, Unified Classroom. They do remember have access on the app, so parents uh, still feel very comfortable with that. Um, there isn't, as you can tell, there's a lot included in Unified Classroom, so it doesn't have a dedicated app. and. Um, so that's why it's nice to have that. And sometimes you just want to go to the app to get the quick information, and that's the intention of an app to be friendly and quick to view. Um, yeah, and students are signing on as they as um, as they need to. So we see a kind of, uh, growing use. I have a question, Mike. Is this where parents can communicate with teachers? Or is this more to just gather information? Um, no, they can also um, communicate. There's um, on any one of the pages, you'll see there is a message button here where if they click on that, they can send a message to the teacher. And the teacher's aware that and the teach and the messages. And they get a notice, they get notified in their inbox. Um, and also, a teacher can send to a parent that way. Um, and um, up here, there's a communication where you can send um, messages also. Okay. Good. Any other questions for Meg Tony? Mr. Gilkey. Can I ask, teachers actually post 
They can. There are types of assignments they can build, and I like to call them like assignments 2.0, where um, you can link um, dis um, discussions, um, they can take uh, little assessments, but they can also post the assignment, the student can pass it in that way. Um, quite a few of our teachers are using Google Classroom to do that currently, so and they feel comfortable with that. So. Um, they haven't bridged that practice over to Unified Classroom. Yeah, as they're growing. And um, many of it's, and this came out of a lot of the birth of parents saying to us and students saying that every that when they go to something, every, when they go to each class, someone's using something different, like uh, Dojo or, or a Google Classroom or maybe at the same time um, Blackboard. But um, this kind of houses everybody, it gives everybody a front door. They might go into separate rooms once they, you know, log in or walk through the front door, which Unified Classroom is. But it's a one place where you begin, and it kind of it helps with organization, not only for those, the students, but it also helps the parent to know where to go. Yeah, I'm going to switch over. So. All right, so we are going to have Meg stay at the podium and talk about our October 1, 2019 official enrollment. Okay, so as you know, each October um, we report to the state our SIMS data, which is 52 elements. Um, and one is students enrolled on October 1st. And you have in front of you those uh, numbers. As you can see at Mitchell um, in PK, we have 151 um, <coughs> students. In kindergarten, we have 255. In first grade, we have 255. In second, we have 256. In third grade, we have 252. For a total of 1,169. At Williams Intermediate School in fourth grade, we have 215 fourth graders, there's 237 fifth graders, and 259 sixth graders for a total of 711. At Bridgewater Middle School, we have a Total of seventh graders of 301, 251 eighth graders, or a total of 552 Bridgewater Middle students. At going to Merrill Elementary now, in kindergarten we have 164 students. In first grade we have 166, or a total of 330. At La Liberty Elementary School and second grade, we have 167. Third grade, we have 181. Fourth grade, we have 177. For a total of 525. At Rainham Middle School in fifth grade, we have 166. In sixth grade, we have 172. In seventh grade, we have 185, and in eighth grade, we have 147, for a total of 670. In the therapeutic day program, we have a, a, one seventh grader, two eighth graders, 
six 10th graders, one 11th grader, and four 12th graders for a total of 14. At Bridgewater Raynham Regional High School, in ninth grade, we have 326. 10th grade, we have 357. 11th grade, we have 359. 12th grade, we have 344. And 12 students who are attending, um, who are SPs, for a total of 1,398. Itinerants, these are students who are service only. We have 31. Excel, we, which is um, uh, high school, we have one 10th grader, eight 11th graders, 17 12th graders for a total of 26. And then our out of district students, we have one uh, kindergartner, one first grader, two second graders, five fifth graders, six sixth graders, two seventh graders, two ninth graders, four tenth graders, five eleventh graders, seven twelfth graders, and nine SPs for a total of 44, giving us a total enrollment of 5,470 students. Okay, now, um, Stood on October 1. Can I? Sure. Okay. If I could, um, just to clarify those out of districts, those are out of district students who may have chosen to go to a private school or a charter school. They're not special education out of district, correct? No, these are. This is the special education. Yeah, district. these are students who are attending um, placements. out of district placement. Uh, due to uh, <coughs> their IEPs. No, these I'm are our these to... are our students that are out of district placements okay. uh, for special education okay. programming that are we cannot service in district. In district. Correct. I know right. what you're saying. That language that, that, that language, language in the parentheses that. is a little bit. Says number, it oh, says I and yes. Yeah, it says non. Did you say? Uh, it say this includes they are. special education attending. Should say just yeah. special education. Okay, all yeah. right. I just yeah. it's I, not school yeah. choice. Okay. Or that's what I was. Bills or anything. Those yep. are our audit district okay. kids. Thank you. Any comments? No, I just I mean, looking at some of the numbers at some of the classes uh, grade levels. Um, you look at some of the rising numbers, especially at the elementary, but even at the middle. I mean, we have seventh grade with the 301 students. I mean, we average any given year 200 to 250. Um, that's definitely a bubble group, uh, but if you look at Rainham Middle, that same seventh grade is the highest number in that, in that, grade le in that um, school as well. Definitely have to keep uh, an eye on, obviously, we're, we're receiving a lot of Purchase and sales agreements. We're getting a lot of folks contacting us, stating that um, they're going to be moving to the district within the next few months. Could they begin here until uh, their homes come online? Which we have granted them that opportunity because we don't want students to have to go start in another district and then two months from now when the house is available to them to have to uproot that student and have another transition during the school year. Um, but definitely at the elementary level, we've got to keep our eyes on some of those growing numbers, um, especially at the Mitchell. Could you also elaborate on the importance of the October 1 for the budget? Yes. So as, as we've stressed to our uh, administrative team at the last administrative council, and every administrative council when we talk about October 1 numbers, October 1 numbers equals money. So we have to make sure that uh, we have clean October 1 numbers to report to the state um, because we do receive additional funding based upon how a student is coded. If a student is special education, ESL, or a special education student with significant needs is a different coding, and that, that is additional monies that we get through um, our Chapter 70. So we have to make sure that, that, um, that the, this uh, information is being reported 
um, checked, which we ask all of our principals to check that information along with uh, their secretaries at, at the building level. One thing that Meg has done a great job of uh, a few years back was creating central registration. I think by central registration uh, being implemented, it's allowed us to have one unified way of uh, inputting this information into our database system. Um, before, you had folks at seven different sites possibly inputting the information in seven different ways, and sometimes things fell through the cracks. And again, we don't want anything falling through the cracks because, again, it equates to, to funding for the district. So the October 1 numbers are uh, very important in, in terms of budget. So I, I do give Meg uh, her kudos um, for being on top of this, thanking my building principals and administrators for uh, checking this information and making any corrections that they deem necessary. And also, I really truly feel as though the um, central registration piece has really helped us in uh, getting some real clean numbers at this time of year. So thank you to Meg and Diane Powers and uh, all the folks that work in that area. Thank you. Any other questions for Meg? Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so we are going to go back up and go to our budget subcommittee report. Mr. Gelfi. The budget subcommittee met on Tuesday, October 15, 2019, at 5 30 p.m. Agenda topics included vaping de detectors with local advocate Pat Neary, attending to continue discussion on the p possible installation of vaping detectors in the high school bathrooms. The district will continue to address the student vaping issue. We received an update on the breakfast program participation and we'll continue to review the data in, that up in the upcoming months. The monthly total thus far was 2,100 breakfasts served district-wide. As part of the facilities report, several rep repairs requiring approval were brought forth. These are emergency replacements due to catastrophic failures at both the Merrill and La Liberty. At Merrill, a temporary, temporary boiler had been rented at a monthly rate of approximately $9,000. The request was to replace two boilers at Merrill, one hot water heater at Merrill, and one boiler at the Mil Liberty. So in the form of a motion, with the endorsement of the Budget Subcommittee, I move to approve the repair project of two boilers and one hot water heater at the Merrill Elementary School and one boiler at the Liberty Elementary to include the cost of the temporary boiler lease and not to exceed $300,000. Motion by Mr. Gelfi, second by Mr. Dolan. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And that would eventually work its way down into Rainham, where they would be reimbursed in the district. Correct. We'll, we'll be looking to put that on the spring wall. Mm -hmm. All right. Is that all you have, Mr. Gelfi? No, Duffy? no. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> just to repeat what you just said, claims have been submitted through our insurance company and are under review. Any remaining <coughs> balance of the repair, repairs will be sent to the town of Rainham for, for reimbursement. Yes. Uh, request of approval for two three-year Bobcat leases. Mr. Pacheco submitted a, a request to enter into two three-year leases for two track loaders at a cost of $9,415 each, totaling $18,830 per year for three years. Including in the cost are two snow thrower attachments, two buckets, and full warranties for three years. One machine will be housed at the Raynham Middle School for use on the Raynham side of the district, and the other at the high school for use on the Bridgewater side of the district. So in the form of a motion and with the endorsement of the Budget Subcommittee, motion to authorize Mr. Pacheco in his capacity as director of facilities to enter into two three-year leases for two track loaders with attachments totaling $18,830 per year for three years. Motion by Mr. Gelfi, second by Mr. Dolan. Any questions? Mr. Pacheco is here. Madam Chair, just to, as a point of clarification, we heard from the uh, during our committee meeting that this was a cost savings to the district by doing this this way versus what was done in the past um, by renting from someone else. So Correct. for folks that are watching thinking that we're spending quite a bit of money on two, three year leases, we're actually saving money in the, compared to what we used to do. And they actually can do more things. Right. Than, 
Right. We have right. we have one on the Rainham side that we, through grants rentals is going to be able about thirteen and change. And we have one currently at the high school that is really being kept together with chewing gum and chicken wire right now. So um, we felt as though getting these two um, machines on both sides of the district for the additional fifteen thousand instead of the constant repairs to the one at the high school uh, would be able to benefit both sides of the district. And can they be used, Mr. Swenson, at different schools? We will be exploring that. Yes, I would say I would say that we could explore that piece to it. Um, there's definitely a need for it um, at Rainham Middle School, obviously, and here at the high school. But we could definitely explore possibly uh, use, usage at other sites as well. Mr. Pacheco. Good evening, everyone. Uh, to the police we could actually just drive right down the road to so it's um, <clears throat> utilizing a snow thrower um, actually it's, it's a more efficient way <coughs> any further questions motion has been made and seconded all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed so voted thank, thank you. you appreciate that one more sentence. Okay. <laughs> the budget subcommittee reviewed the updates to the capital improvement plan, began its FY21 budget discussion, and received quarterly reports from Ms. Macedo and Mr. Conlon. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right. And now we are actually going to move on to the quarterly FY20 budget report. Mrs. Macedo. Good evening, Madam Chair. Of the school committee. I'll just start very loud. Oh, wait a minute. There it goes. I'll hold it. Okay. <laughs> uh, good evening, mem um, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, and uh, Superintendent Swenson. Um, you have a budget report in front of you that um, is uh, for the quarter. And, but it does also include the first um, warrant that's in October. Uh, usually the budget subcommittee meets monthly and we go over each month's budget report and then we bring it here to you quarterly. Um, just to let you know on a few things, um, we have put on a freeze uh, starting in October. So everyone got in all their purchases that they absolutely had to have. Um, and we will go forward uh, by approving uh, those emergency type purchases um, so that we can, you know, obviously if someone needs something, we have to, we'll have to get it. But um, we are trying to control the budget by uh, getting us through the winter, getting us through the heating season, snow season, and hopefully um, come springtime, we'll be in good, good standing so we can do maybe some purchasing for uh, going forward. <coughs> Um, it's always worked for us in the past, so it's been a good measure that, a good practice that we've done. Uh, most of all these uh, accounts have been encumbered and we've gone through and looked at um, any accounts that may uh, be in deficit where maybe we hadn't planned uh, for this to happen and that to happen or folks have moved around and we planned for them to be at the Bridgewater Middle and now they've moved to the Random side. So we've gone through all of those accounts and we've um, corrected any of those issues. There are still a few things that we have to um, be mindful of and watch very um, diligently throughout the year. And um, we're looking at things such as on page four, um, we always want to look at our subline accounts. Uh, right now, there hasn't been um, much activity. And however, we're not into the flu season and, and the snow issues or, or other emergencies that may come up during the year. Um, so right now all of those accounts are in a healthy situation. We do have one of our special ed accounts for um, therapeutic OTPT that has an encumbrance uh, that is putting the account into deficit. This is an account I'm going to watch. Um, usually we have an estimate and at the year end we probably will release funds. So hopefully that deficit of 217 won't be quite what it is right now. But we'll keep an eye on it 
and also keep an eye on where we will take funds from to cover those types of expenses. Um, another account that or area that we like to keep track of is in the uh, on page uh, page eight, I believe I was looking at. Right one, no, wait a minute, I think it's on the right number. Oh, sorry, I put the wrong number. I meant page, oh, there it is, page eight. I had the wrong page. Uh, oh, I know what I want to talk about here. All right, on page eight, um, you'll notice our transportation area. And in the past, we've had some... Um, issues with some of our special ed transportation as we've gotten new students in. Um, we've had some issues with, you know, having some transportation costs that were much higher than what we had anticipated. This year we have everything encumbered. We don't have those big deficits that we had seen. Um, as long as things remain the way they are at this point in time, I think we'll be okay in this area. But again, it's an area I'm always going to watch because there's always new students coming in or students that are being newly identified. Page uh, nine, utilities. Again, uh, electricity. Uh, we knew that we may be uh, needing to use funding from uh, facilities or from the base program to help, um, seeing that we do use a lot of Electricity, we have a lot of these buildings are open quite frequently. Um, however, we just did the bid with combis. We had to go in last year and kind of get in the loop with them. We were in with them. We were paying over almost to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. We are now down to 9 cents per kilowatt hour. So we're anticipating seeing some better numbers um, for electricity. Uh, we haven't gotten our first bill yet because this started as of October 1st, so I hope in November I'll start seeing uh, some of that. Bob and I can take a look at it and see how we're doing, um, and then can project out the rest of the year much, much more uh, better than what we have right now. But right now we're just doing based on trend. So I'm hoping that that number is going to go down, that deficit there. And let's see. Page 12, our last page. Um, as you know, we have a circuit breaker funds that we have in a revolving account. And we are allowed to charge off um, certain uh, special education costs, like teaching services or um, materials. Where we find it most effective and the best way and best use of the funding is to use it to help charge off some of our out-of-district tuitions. But we can't charge it off to those circuit breaker funds until we've actually spent the money. So if you notice on the tuition public school day and residential and collaboratives, uh, range to date and year to date, nothing's been spent. Well, that's because I've already charged off what's been spent to circuit breaker. And we still have about another million two, I believe, in circuit breaker funds. So I think we'll be able to cover whatever deficits are showing up based on those encumbrances. But again, the encumbrances may also be reduced on their own as students change and move into different settings. Uh, so for this moment in time, I think we're in good stead. And um, we'll just keep our eye on all those little snow troubly areas. and. Um, keep reporting to you on a quarterly basis. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you very much. OK. Thank Thanks, you. Right, next up, we have our quarterly treasures report. Mr. Conley. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the school committee, Superintendent Swenson. I want to give you a report for my income and expenses. I did uh, provide you with an adjustment sheet that I, um, one of my cells didn't take, so I want to make sure that you had that. Um, that was on my income and expenses. Just on the revenue, um, looking at the sheets, uh, Chapter 70, again, this is 25% of um, July, August, um, 
July, August, and September. So we're doing well with that. Uh, high school athletic fees, um, we're doing well, about 71, 25%. But, um, investment of funds, we're um, certainly over on that, and that figure will probably be just in the next, um, next year's budget. Um, but we're doing okay with that. Um, miscellaneous revenue is a little bit low. Um, Medicaid uh, hasn't come in yet from the state. We'll wait for that. Um, parking revenue fees are just over $100. Um, we put in for $29,000. We got $29,100. Rental school facilities, um, we're at about 61% of that. Um, e and D, nothing on that yet. That won't be till near the end of the year. Random construction debt and Bridgewater construction debt. Um, we're close to those figures too, to 25%. Uh, and the Bridgewater assessment and the random assessment. Again, we're uh, close to, we're at 25%. And I did provide you, like I said, with um, what I had for uh, income from all of those. Then I provided you with the um, expenses for the payrolls and the taxes. Um, and then payroll for retirement, intra, um, insurance and dues, then the warrants that we do each month, I provided that with the total expenses, um, and then take away the total expenses, uh, less the income, and then I also gave you my treasurer's bank balance for what we had for each month. So. Any questions for Mr. Conley? So, Mr. Conley, the, um, Construction debt, is that quarterly? Is that why there was no payment in the month of September from either um, side? It's not quarterly, it's, it comes at different, you know, construction debt comes at different times during um, the year. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in, um, uh -huh. yeah, based on, again, thanks Kath, based on not when, a we monthly, borrow, like, yes, no. when we borrow, yep, when we borrow the money and stuff, so. Okay. Um, and they that's when they make their payments to us. Any other questions for Mr. Kahn? Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Next, we're going to move on to our CPAC report. Mr. Florence. Um, on October 2nd, the BRC PAC hosted a meet and greet at the Superintendent's Conference Room. BRC PAC pr uh, parent president Kate Dwyer, Kate Dyer, and Student Service Director Paul Jovalos hosted this meeting and introduced the district special education team and the wide array of educational programs and services that the district utilizes to meet the educational needs of our students. During this meeting, Mrs. Dyer highlighted the many educational resources that CPAC provides to support parents. Each month, the BR CPAC will host an educational presentation on varying topics that address the interests and concern, concerns parents have regarding our students. The next BR CPAC event will be November 14th from 6 to 8 p.m. at La Liberty Elementary. This family uh, special education night provides parents, guardians, with a place to gather information from 30 plus organizations that offer services to children with special needs. Local representatives from various organizations will provide parents with support and guidance. While parents are gathering information, children will be supervised in active and active in sports activities, art projects, and eating healthy snacks. We'll also be holding a raffle to raise funds for the BRC pack and John's Dream Ice Cream will be selling ice cream treats. Please join us, all are welcome. CPAC is currently running four different raffles. Winners will be drawn at the Family Special Education Night on November 14th. Deadline to pre-purchase and return raffle tickets to school is Monday, November 11th. A flyer with speci uh, specific details regarding prizes and, uh, and the purchase of tickets has been sent home from each school. Finally, parents and guardians are encouraged to join BRCPAC on Facebook. This Facebook page will share announcements regarding upcoming events along with a variety of educational articles and resources. Thank you. Very good. Any questions for Mr. Florence? Thank you very much. All right, and now we're going to move on to the Mitchell School Building Project update. Mr. Carson. Yes, Madam Chair, and I am very pleased to inform the full committee and members of the audience, both here in attendance and at home this evening, that on Saturday, October 19th, 2019, the wonderful residents of Bridgewater exercised their civic duty and voted in favor of the schematic design and project budget the new George H. Mitchell Elementary School, 
with 2,157 votes for yes versus 1,498 votes for no for an overall differential of 659 votes passing question one. I would personally like to thank all of the wonderful residents of Bridgewater who came out to vote on Saturday. A special thanks also goes out to our incredible team comprised of community volunteers, parents, teachers, support staff, administrators, and school committee members who worked tirelessly over the course of the last five years in order to provide our students and staff with what they require and deserve. Please know that all of your efforts on behalf of the children of Bridgewater are to be commended and greatly appreciated. In regards to next steps, I have been in contact with our OPM, Shane Nolan from Daedalus Projects Incorporated, and he has informed me that now the MSBA will prepare a project funding agreement or PFA, and send it to the district for execution. This updates the project scope and budget agreement and formalizes the MSBA's commitment to fund the remaining of the project. The OPM and designer amendments for design and construction administration services must be ex executed as well. Please note that these are standard MSBA contract amendments. The MSBA will then execute a work order with commissioning agents. This will include the exterior envelope, fire protection, plumbing, mechanical, and electrical commissioning services. The commissioning agent's fees is paid 100% by the MSBA. Then the fund begins with module six and detailed design, which is about a 10 month process. First starting with design development, which will uh, be approximately four months. Then providing documentation for 60% construction documents, which is about another three months. And then 90% construction documents, which is another three months. Finally, please note that the school building committee will continue to act on behalf of the district to oversee the development of each design phase and approve the submissions to MSBA at the end of each phase. And that is the end of my report. Exciting, exciting news. So thank you, Bridgewater, uh, for all the support and uh, our incredible team as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mrs. Swenson? Very good. All right. Next up, we have our new business. And first is the approval of the high school graduation date for 2019-2020 school year. Mr. Powers. And Madam Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Clemson, uh, on behalf of the Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School, I am here tonight to present to you uh, the potential for the high school graduation date. Uh, as you know, it is uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, part of their regulations uh, to have the graduation date approved by our school committee. Uh, currently, the proposed date for graduation will again be a Friday night, and we are proposing Friday, May 29th, 2020 and it is tentatively scheduled for 6 p.m. Our desired location would again be on the football field. Uh, certainly we understand that inclement weather may prevent us from doing so, uh, but that would obviously be a game time decision that we would make uh, along with Mr. Swenson and the Director of Facilities, Mr. Pacheco, and we would still hold it on Friday, May 29th, 2020. If we do have to uh, change the location, it would be obviously inside like we have in the past in the gym. Uh, but either way, we are requesting that Friday, May 29th, 2020, be set aside for the Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School graduation. All right. Do I have a motion for the high school graduation for May 29th? Motion by Mr. Hammond, second by Mr. Florence. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So voted. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you, Mr. Powers. All right. And next up on the agenda, it looks like we need to approve an MOU regarding transportation claiming under Title Four dash E, and I'll just read the motion. <coughs> um, actually, why don't I read the motion? Then you can. Perfect. Uh, the motion is to authorize the superintendent to enter into a memorandum of understanding between the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the Department of Children and Families, and the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District in relation to the administration of school or origin transportation costs under the Every Student Succeeds Act to maximize federal financial participation from the federal government 
through Title IV-E of the Social Security Act, otherwise known as Title IV-E. With that, um, motion by so moved. Mr. Dolan, second by Mrs. Holbrook, and Mrs. Macedo, if you could enlighten us, that would be wonderful. What this is going to allow us to do is to be able to now um, receive reimbursement on transportation for foster students. Okay. So we'll be able to get some more funding. And so we're already picking up these children, and this would allow us to actually get reimbursed. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, so there's a motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. All right, and next up we have our acceptance of gifts and grants. Mr. Swenson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this evening I only have one um, very generous gift to um, bring forth to the committee, and it's for 150 nonfiction science books for the Williams Intermediate School, which has been donated by Mastria Subaru. Very good. Motion to approve the gifts. Motion by Mrs. King, second by Mr. Gelfie. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So voted. Thank, Thank you. Madam Chair, can I just ask, I'm sorry, to go back to the Mitchell School? Sure. Uh, I had a question. I know it's solar ready going to be solar ready, right? Has the district investigated grants or anything to actually get that solar on there or mm -mm. start with? Are you waiting? Or? Yeah, it's the town would have to investigate that piece. Oh, it's not it's the Gelfie district. because it's a town project. So um, it is going to be solar ready. We just have to figure out at that point whether they want to utilize that uh, equipment to um, possibly put in solar panels and, and sell off that electricity to private the, ventures. So the committee is working with the Bridgewater um, Green Committee. Uh, Dr. Carlton Hunt is the chair of that, so we've been working with him. He's come to a few of our meetings. Uh, next up, we have public comment. Anyone in the public wish to speak? Maybe. And before we adjourn, I only have one announcement, and that's that our November school committee uh, meeting will be November 20th, and that will be at the Rainham Middle School. Does anyone on the committee have any other announcements? Very good. So motion to adjourn at 8.32. Motion by Mrs. King, second by Mrs. Holbrook. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So voted. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.